on the side though. I don't monetize it. I think it's cleaner. Yeah. And unless you you have viral videos, you know, like penis, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're live. All right. Okay, so please ask questions. We want to discuss it any time. Um, so functional claiming. Uh, very popular in software and processes, which software is a process actually, um, but can be used mechanical. Uh, the example I have, we'll get to that in, is a, it's a blow mold container for a uh, defibrillator. Someone's getting a patent on, they did get a patent on it. So that's a mechanical device. So it's a, it's a clamshell container and um, the patentable aspect of it is those things, you mount them on the wall, and uh, they normally would take a key or a security code to get in so people can't get in them and steal them or whatever. So it had a deal, you know, like the, the fire extinguishers, they, they used to be blocked in a little closet and they used break the glass or something. So this had a, a plastic pull zip that would unlock it. And then they, um, I guess they'd know who pulled the zip. So they could see, but you still had access to it um, in an emergency. Let me get rid of this thing. Is that the one that they took gas from the flashman? Yeah. This one? Yeah. But we'll, uh, we'll talk some generalities before that. So, um, we have numbers in the patent world that refer to statutes, patent laws. So this is 112 stuff, <laughs> which is if you claim something in a functional manner, you have to have a supported specification to back it. Okay, so what is a functional claim? <laughs> I'll start with this. Maybe this top side of the copy cover. Okay, so in the patent world, things are either structure or function. Structure is a physical component. So if this wasn't invented yet, uh, my structure is broadly stated a base and a surrounding sidewall extending through the base, right? No limitations on size, configuration, materials, shape, and all that sort of stuff. But that's a structural plane. A functional claim for this would be uh, a means for separating two volumes. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm, I'm describing the invention by what it does. And usually it's got a prefix of a means for, and then fill in the blank. And, and what comes after the means word is function and not structure. So if you had it, if you had it like an invention needed a motor, but I didn't, I want to broadly claim, I don't want to say, oh, it's an electric motor. I don't care what drives it. I just need a shaft turning, right? So saying means for imparting rotational energy. That's a functional claim. So I haven't defined any specific structure to accomplish the function. So the reason we do that, it's very broad claiming, so that for the infringer, the patent, it doesn't matter how they make that shaft turn, whether it's a steam engine, a gas engine, a turbine, a squirrel in a cage, a rubber band, whatever, it, it's open. It's just that in the specification, you have to say somewhere, the means for imparting rotational motion is preferably fill in the blank or suitable alternative. So you have to have something there. But that limitation won't be imported into the claim necessarily. Yeah. <clears throat> so this first uh, part, uh, presumption that 112F does not apply. Uh, it says, you know, that the standard patent claiming is means for and then functional wording. But not obvious. You could just say 
uh, structure for uh, providing, you know, there's a lot of prefixes. But um, it says the presumption is overcome when the claim term fails to recite structure or recites function without structure. And um, sometimes we do put a little bit of structure in a functional claim, but it's not related to the functional accomplishing. So if I said means for imparting rotational motion to the primary shaft. Okay, I've thrown a little piece of structure, but that's just saying I impart rotational motion here. But how I create the rotational motion, I don't specify. So sometimes there can be a little piece of structure. Mainly, it's just a location thing. Like I'm saying, the means plus function goes here, but it's still a function. So, functional claims are good, but a little bit risky. So, um, the next slide, which goes up to 27. You have to put up with these stupid cats. And it's covering up my page numbers. So I'm, Susan, I'm just picking, there's so much here, I'm just picking kind of the important parts. Yeah. And at the email attachment, you've got everything. So this is uh, kind of some patent office boilerplate. on uh, how much support the uh, description has. So the anatomy of a patent is the claims are at the end. It's usually like one to 20 of them. They're shorter, shorter language, just paragraphs. The whole body of the patent, which is all the text before it, which say the claim to be two pages, body of the patent to be 20 pages. And then that includes drawings, figures, that's all it's called in the description with the specification. So that written description and the, and the figures have to support what's being claimed. So if I look at any word in any claim, I go, okay, means for imparting rotation of motion. I have to be able to go somewhere in the spec and find that fine. Okay. If I said the means for rotation is imparted to the primary shaft, then I have to find that primary shaft has to be defined in text and shown in the figure. If it isn't, then that claim has to be deleted. So that's what's called support. So the claim is like the tip of the iceberg, and then the support is the larger description behind it. <clears throat> and it's um, called a day, right? So the theory is it gives one skill in the art the ability to make any of this invention off what's in the patent. And that's like how much detail you have to put in the patent. So that's really guided by if a part of your invention is commonly known, you don't have to detail it out. But the part that's not have to detail out. And the most inventions use bits and pieces of well-known stuff and new stuff, right? So this written description requirement uh, says that, you know, it must be enough detail such that one skill they aren't, you know, it's basically can make and use invention without the inventor's help so that the patent turns into kind of a technical library. And of course, there, there's always a lot of debate who this mythical ordinary skill in the is. 
Yes. But it's it's basically what's commonly known. So it's not PhD level, and it's not someone right on the street. It's sort of a technician yeah. level. Yeah. The technician the working field. But the thing is, to be safe in the patent, you should probably go a little bit too descriptive. Because if you're not descriptive enough, that's risky. Because yes. once you file a patent, it's 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 a sealed amount of information you can't add to it. There's no time. And if it's not a sufficient amount, you're you're screwed because you have to file another patent that has those extra things. Yeah. Isn't it used to have to be kind of big? Just the claims, not the spec. So the, the other reason you want kind of a long and detailed spec is when you get off this action, you can make amendments. And we can make revisions to the claims to make the examiner and the patent office happy. Well, that doesn't sound too bad, but there's a big catch-22 on it. That the changes you make to the claims have to be predefined in the specification. I can't just throw anything I want into that amendment. I have to say, I'm adding something to this claim, and it's defined on page 12, paragraph 2. It has to be in there. So you make a toolbox bigger by having a bigger specification. You know, if you're past three pages, you could have very little flexibility. Right. Yeah. I have a patent application in a squeezable um, drinking cup. Paper and the meeting cup, so there was not enough, you know, in this presentation, but you know, I was able to get the patent on that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, sometimes the, I, I would say the more complicated is the, the, the subject matter, what you're trying to patent, the better it is, because the, well, the more complicated it is, it, you always have capability of. Uh, uh, making new claims or something that's going to be claimed yet, so you can then overcome the rejection and then and pick up from the specification, especially when they are when something is very complex and, and the long specification you are page page, you're always able to find some. It gives you more options. Exactly, and more options. More. Because uh, and think about a patent. Legally, it's a piece of just like your house. And a patent claim is the legal description of the piece of property. So you know, on real property, you define a shape, right? And you eventually get back to where you started. Right? You go 35 feet northwest, and then you go 58 feet, you know. And you do all this stuff, and you define a boundary, right? So that's the claim, the legal claim on the property. So a patent just takes that concept over to a gadget, and we define it with words, a boundary. And then, but it's kind of like, not real obvious, because land is simple, it's in 2D. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the up and down, you just define it. But you can, you can look at it this way, like, when you do a legal description, of, say real property, uh, you're defining a boundary structurally, right? Do you ever say anything functionally? No, never. You don't say it's property for a high rise, it's property for a duplex, it's property for a parking No, you don't do that. You just say the property is defined by this. You don't talk about what you put on it, right? That's the function of the property. So in claiming, a lot of times, you know, we just talk the structure. And then we sometimes go into the function to broaden it up a little bit. Uh, software, chemical processes, electronics can be done mechanical too. But like, let's say you invented uh, an electronic gadget, right? And it, uh, it's a new way of validating the user instead of passwords, maybe it uses your skin or something, right? So you would say a functional claim would be um, my invention has control circuitry to uh, do biometric identification. So I'm defining the function as biometric identification. 
that I'm just saying, oh, it's got control circuitry. Could be anything. Of course, the reason I want to do that is when someone infringes it, if they change my circuitry, I want my patent coverage. So you don't want to be locked down to like a particular chip, right, and then program a certain way that's too specific. So what if I wanted a patent on uh, like a medicine cabinet? Do I describe not only the outside, but the inside? Yeah, yeah. And then you can also do the method of making it and the method of using it. Sometimes, you know, you're just you're just trying to protect from different angles to, to broaden the coverage. That's if the method of making and using have say some unique steps. Yeah, sometimes it's a, you know, a structure uh, uh, definition is always stronger than eventually a use of culture. Right, a structural definition is uh, easier to pack, yes. but probably a little bit narrower. So this is, because you should say to me, well, why do you do functional claiming? It seems kind of like very amorphous, but we're trying to be amorphous. <laughs> and that's just because when someone infringes, we don't know exactly what they're going to do. They're going to change it up a bit. And so we want to try to have us, this amorphousness flexible enough to cover their deviations. As much as we can. You know what I mean? That's what a patent really is for. A patent doesn't care what you make. We're just trying to block outsiders from copying you. Even if you never make it, it doesn't matter. You make it, you don't make it. Whatever. But when the outside of the knockoff makes it, they're usually going to try to change a few things. And so we want to have that covered, you know, or force them to dramatically change the invention to take it outside of your path. So what if, <clears throat> what if the medicine cabinet you find different ways to attach it? Do you put every way to attach it? Yeah, now that's a good functional claim. You would just say means for attaching to a structure, or what we call an article. An article is when an invention interfaces with that's not part of the invention. So an article could be a wall, a door, a ceiling, floor, whatever. But that's one thing you, you have to be careful of. when you're defining the invention a claim is make sure that you're not including and silvery things that you don't want to so, Right. You need to focus on the novelty yeah. of, of the. Uh, Let's say you invented a new carburetor, a fuel injector, or a gas engine, right? You don't claim that uh, fuel injector in combination with the car engine because you'd be combining and marrying yourself. You just say it's a fuel injector. So if your infringer put on a farm engine or an airplane or whatever, you're kind of. See, so you really try to strip things down as much as you can. Just like this, if I was claiming this, I leave off this ridge, I leave off this taper, I don't have a handle. So I really pare it down to its, you can pare it down to where it doesn't work. You know, like if I left the base off, it wouldn't work. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you really have to think minimally. Sure. Yeah. Is that sort of the shorter the claim, the broader the coverage. But if you go too short, it'll be hard to get approved. And, uh, but you know, for right? yeah. and sometimes the claim interpretation of work yes. is not in your control as much. I mean, in a perfect world, you want a narrow focus claim. <laughs> on exactly what your bridge is doing, then that's your strongest case. But outside of that, it's kind of like you don't know shooting with a high-powered rifle with a scope. But if that isn't going to work, then I'll take a shot at it. 
which is broader but not as effective like, in the narrow range. And that's what a road broad idea is. I have to go to the next one. So uh, is this this was the uh, January now I'll go to the March. There's March. Did you go to claim easier? You called and it's very generic. So you call, you protect a, a, a quite a big territory, right? And if you, if you don't know, if you then you go in the specific, specific, then you will limit your protection. So, right? So you, you eventually start. Something genetic, it's not necessarily wild. Well, that's why you do, you do multiple claims in a pattern. You broad, generic, so you try to cover your lot of 20 on, on your base file fee, and then you can add more if you pay extra. Mm -hmm. So, some the, the reason people use those up is sometimes you take the same invention, you might have two or three versions of it. So, you want to cover, say, your three versions. Because you don't know which one's going to sell the best, right? And then it may be version two is selling well, version one, three aren't. So you file a continuation pattern and expand coverage of version two to better cover what is selling the market. So you, you can kind of customize your pattern to fit your needs. Because everyone faces the same problem. You got to do your pattern before you're selling or you're on the market heavily. So you don't really know what's going to shake out. Right. You just guess, you know, speculate. But everybody faces it. So you get the patent in, and then go to market. <laughs> That's my case. I, I never know what kind of uh, marketing work with this thing. Yeah, yeah. So I the shocking back for me. Yes. Yeah. So if you go to uh, it's the March uh, 2019 page 22. So more of 112F. So this kind of goes along with what you're saying, Suzanne. Like the, um, if you read here, um, about in the middle on the right side, it talks about means for fastening. So that's a functional claim. So your cabinet has a means for fasting. So that mean, means that whatever you have in the spec is everything is covered. So you'll say screws, nails, adhesive, Velcro, and equivalents, you know. You just try to think of everything. But on the other hand, what I might do in the broad claim on a medicine cabinet, I won't even say it's attached to anything. I'll just define the medicine cabinet like it's hanging in the air. So, because there was one rule when you, when you start new pack claiming, pretend that the invention is floating in outer space and write the claim looking at it floating by itself, and you'll end up with a broader claim. Because the whole thing is you have to define the invention to itself. And not to anything on Earth. In other words, there's no up or down, there's no left or right. You know, you just define it to itself. And that sounds weird, but that's it's worse. <laughs> sure, sure. Oh, that's the, the, the fastening of the of the cabinet is part of the invention. Because you know, what if someone came up with your cabinet and had magnetic levitation? <laughs> so, yeah. do you list things that you don't even, you probably aren't going to use, but just to cover everything? You're trying to cover everything under the sun as much as possible. You know, flexibility. So think of uh, any invention is that prototype is one 
we would call it lens specific embodiment, one version. version. But there's a, like an umbrella concept to that version. So we're trying to put that in the umbrella in the cat. And, and under the umbrella is a lot of different versions. Oh, okay, so we to the blow mode container. So they had some medical and software, but they're they're just kind of harder to borrow. But in like um, chemical compositions, uh, it's forty nine. Chemical compositions. You know, you would do that to broaden a lot. Like you'd say, uh, one of my steps in making a composition is to add a means for diluting, or something like that. Right? So a lot of a lot of fluids have worked for diluting, but I don't want to take myself down. But I have to dilute it. So that would be an example of that kind of chemical composition. But anyway, this is a nice, good old mechanical. <laughs> so this is the uh, a defibrillator container. It snaps permanently shot, uh, shut, mounts in the wall. Could be sitting on a table too. It's uh, it's double wall, it's got cushioning, so it kind of protects the, mm -hmm. the uh, electronic device, the electronic apparatus. I should say that, anyway, proper claiming device, this is a device because it's one piece. An apparatus is an assembly of things. So um, most things are apparatus, two or more pieces. So you can see in uh, figure two, element 12 is that cool zipper. It's like molded in, and then you pull it apart to get the, you know, the figure uh, out. So now that you see this picture, um, now we're going to go to the next slide and we're going to have the claim for it. That's the bottom. So this is actually there's four claims here. So the way we work it in hacks is to say uh, claim one is called the independent. So it's the broadest claim. And then claims two, three, and four, you read those as Claim one, say claim two, you read this claim one plus what claim two says. Okay. Claim three, you read it as claim one plus what claim three says. So those are called dependents. 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 Because they are dependent from the, the overall claim one, which is defined in the overall invention. But you can tell that independent because it doesn't refer to a claim above it. Okay, yeah, yeah. so we cannot be sure. You can see that uh, all the dependents have a container of claim one. You have a claim of claim one, so everybody is dependent on claim one. So we can kind of dissect this claim. So um, claim one, that first sentence is called the preamble of the claim. Typically, it's not legally limiting. Usually the preamble is just the title and the environment. Or maybe a very generic description of what the invention does. So we say a molded container. Okay, so containers, the invention title, or I say well molded container. And then the environment is that it encases uh, an automated external food. 
in it, comprising just means like, okay, it includes element A, B, C, and then C is broken down to C1, CI, and then C double I. So, this claim has functional and structure. They can be combined. So, uh, A is a structure, body, even though it's pretty broad, but a body is a piece of structure. Okay? A cover is a piece of structure. A hinge is a piece of structure. An elongated grip is a piece of structure. But on C double I, you know, we say a member for initiating separate disposal of the grip. So that's the function. The word member could be substituted for means. You say means for, and then the function is it initiates severing. And then like here, we have just the location. Like I said, the primary shaft means rotation. So we're saying the means for initiating severing is located at the end of the grid. Okay, so C double I is a functional part, okay? Now you look at plane two, that's a functional plane because we say the hinge has a function of rotating the matrix. We don't give any structure for the hinge to do that. We just say it's capable. And then three is a double wall container. That's structure. So what three does is it adds structure, then it adds a little bit of functional statement for the uh, the reason for the double wall. Okay. Because you know if you if you made a claim and you said um, the container the container is double wall <laughs> and said nothing else, then you know the patent office would probably say well. You have to have a reason for what's the what's the function, right? So, so you define the function very briefly. Mm -hmm. right? And then uh, four claim four says a member for initiating separating. Okay, so we have added as a dependent claim uh, structure of member or part structure. So I can I can do the same things like. Means for uh, initiating rotational motion. I can have a dependent plane and say, where in said means is a electric motor, something like that. So that's pretty much a good roundup of the planes of that, that figure. Now, I'll kind of critique how this could be planed better and what they should have done. Okay. So if you go back to the uh, Preamble of one. Okay, I would remove the word molded. Why? Why dictate the method of manufacturing? There's no purpose in it. Just say it's a container, right? Yeah. Who cares how you yeah, make it? Right? Right? If you if you uh, stomp it out with your feet, mold it, or to cast it. Yeah. There's no need to limit it. And also. I would say, okay, a container for encasing an article. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it in this ADD. There's no need for it. Because then I've narrowed myself down. If it's someone copies my container and, and puts tools in it, right. they're going to argue, well, I, I'm different than your preamble. So it's just like this. If I claim this, I don't say it's for offering. I just say it has two volumes, right? The inside and the outside. So it's just like your property description. You don't say what you're going to do with the property. You just mm -hmm. define the property. You don't want to specify yeah. that this will cost you. So if you and so, all that out, you would take all the rest out. And so on the, the preamble, I would say a container for encasing an article. And like I said, an article is something that interfaces with an invention, but it, it's nothing defined specifically. And then for element A, 
I would just say a body. Leave on portion. And uh, B is good, I covered. That's pretty, pretty simple. And um, a hinge, I don't know. You know, you could convert that to a uh, functional plane. You could say a, uh, a means for uh, allowing uh, the body to open or something like that. The hinge is kind of narrow. Yeah, because there's a specific so, structure for it. Yeah, it's pretty it's specific. Quite, quite specific. And actually, I would leave off CI, yes. and I would just say that the member for initiating severing a long um, the means for uh, Movement of the body or something. Sometimes you, have these you can you can strain functional. You know they don't like it, but you know like if I said if for C on C I said means for uh, dynamic attachment of body and head. Then I said a member for initiating severing. At said means for the attachment, you could do that. So anyway, that's just a critique. How that claim could be written more broad, and you know, to re remove uh, unnecessary detail. So that's my story. That's going to it. I will blow up a slide. Isn't this fun? <laughs> <laughs> So um, this is um, the gist of this presentation. It's four patent office examiners, and what they're trying to do is uh, nail down the scope of their search because they're going to do a search on this. So the question is: Is the term molded in the preamble impose limits? And it says, yes, it does. See, that's why we don't want it in there. Um, so what, what that's saying in question one there on the right is that the examiner's search scope would be limited to molded. Sometimes the inject is not even there when you want to call there and energy. Yeah. Just a little flexibility of the material automatically allowed to open and close it without effort. Yeah, these days, um, ninjas, right? <laughs> there's so many different manufacturing processes like 3D printing or something, which is a kind of a hybrid of molding and layering, I guess. Sure, there's so many ways to. So, uh, you don't want somebody infringing this just because they. They make it without molding, they go, well, I'm not my leader man. Or they're crazy. Or they they copied everything else. <laughs> or they didn't use the traditional image, which is uh, the axle, uh, but they use uh, some little flexibility of the material to close it. Right? So, question two is for the scope of the search does encasing the AED limit the structure? And I say yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, that's bad for the inventor. <laughs> well, the sure. to bad. Yeah. yeah. Now, with the word, you see the word, the letters B R I. That that means a broadest reasonable interpretation. So that's what the examiner is going through. And looking at the BRI of your claim for their search of scope, their scope of search, I guess. <clears throat> so 
So here, they're going through the test um, on uh, C double I. Is that a functional plane? It says um, three prong test is the first prong is is member a generic placeholder? Yeah, it's like the same as means. Okay. Uh, is member modified by functional language? So the functional language is initiating ser severing. Yes. Uh, is the member not modified by sufficient structure to perform the plane function? And then, so, you know, they bring up a good point here. So we got the, the initiating severing function. We've got it positioned at the end of the rib. So the, the question 3C is, does dispose of one in the rib impart structure to the member? It says yes, but does not add structure that accomplishes the function. So again, that's like saying means for initiating rotational energy at the primary member that still doesn't tell you how to initiate rotational motion. So as you know, we kind of already knew in claim one, C double I is a functional part of the claim. <clears throat> now here's that um, on the next one, page 53. Um, they talk about uh, is in claim one element A is uh, body portion. Functional claim element. I said, okay, even though body's broad, it's not followed by functional language. We just say body. Portion's really kind of meaningless. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but uh, uh, see, what we're saying, Susan, there's nothing after body that's functional language, not functional sense. So that's a structural requirement. So, um, I gave a mechanical example because it's probably the easiest to follow, but it's easy to get stuck in the willows of functional planning on electronics, software, and chemical stuff. Um, Let's say you're uh, you're getting a new Wi-Fi antenna, right? With uh, daisy chaining or what I would say. Okay, I have a, a, a big open building structure, right? And I want Wi-Fi in it. So you're saying my Wi-Fi has the ability for the antennas to daisy chain and amplify instead of each one broadcasting separately. So if I'm at one end of the building, I get a strong signal. So I might functionally claim that a Wi-Fi system with uh, multiple antennas and daisy chain signal amplification. That's a functional claim, right? So I can claim that. But the patent office will look to the specification and say, okay, where's the hardware and software that makes this happen? Because I if I if I define this plurality of radio antennas that can that can uh, daisy chain, I gotta show how I can really make it work. Because this it's a concept right. in the claim. So yeah. I'm gonna need like specific software, firmware, and hardware that makes that happen. Or else, I, if I don't do that, or I don't do it in much detail, I risk they'll come back and say, your claim is not a 
support mm -hmm. of our name of the patient. In other words, you don't have a real intention. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we do this in a pack. You know, if a client, they have this good concept, but they don't have the invention completely ironed out detail, right? So we'll just get the concept in and protect it with the understanding and we've got to put the detail in later. That way they've got partial protection for now. Not perfect. But some protection's better than none. <laughs> because uh, if you wait to put in any patent until you have the system perfected, it may harm you because it's okay to like come in ahead of time. But it's, it's very easy to, uh, the functional claiming, it, it stands out in a mechanical, but in, in the process software and chemical uh, inventions, it, it, they're kind of defined more in terms of their function. Right? I mean, it's just like your phone. What, what do you call a screen and display, right? You're defining it functionally. You don't say it's a multi-layer LED um, substrate with, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Under protection. Yeah. Uh, uh, with, you know, a plurality of uh, different color LEDs. Also sensitive to the touch, right? Uh, to the touch of the energy. Mm -hmm. That's, you think that this is sensitive? Yeah, yeah. see those things, you, yeah. we just kind of default in defining them functionally. Like touch screen, right? Mm -hmm. That's a functional description. But you're not really saying how it works. You know, the structure. Yeah. Any questions or <laughs> comments? Definitely interesting. Yeah. Is uh, the fight is on the world. Yeah. So generally, if you claim the function, you're broader. That. They're riskier to get approved. We'll get approved in that office. Sure. So, you know, the best way to probably do it is claim your invention both ways, structurally and functionally, and then see what happens in the office action. And then there is also a method of. Uh, yeah, of construction of the your invention. Because the whole thing is that the patent office yes. is then is to uh, ask for more than you know you can get. So that when they pull you in, you know you've got all of you. So that's why, you know, you do those, say, 20 claims. Some you know are way broad, some you know are somewhat narrow. And ideally, you want the patent office to come back and say, I reject 10 and accept 10. Then you know so where the line in the sand is, so to speak. Yeah. That's where they're saying your, your boundary. So if they're all like rejected or all accepted, you don't know where that boundary is. Right. They're all that's, accepted. And that's kind of a problem. And so that happens sometimes. If they're 100% rejected, it's like they're saying everything you did is too broad. Right. And the line in the sand, you have to move up to it. And if you get everything accepted, that's bad too. Oh, that means yes. you didn't you ask know. for enough. <laughs> right. And so, you know, clients will think, oh, we were rejected. It's so bad that actually you want to be rejected. Yeah. So you know <clears throat> you overreached. <laughs> so you said function, uh, to claim both functional and structural, and then what was the other one? What do you use the point? Process. Process to, to make it. Making and using. Right. Which is really functional. I mean, process. Yeah, it's a, it's a process for right. using. Because a process it. is like steps. To make it. Right. Yeah. There is any 
to see the truth. Yeah. And then also to use it. You know, Possibly, if it's got some unique. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the process of using this, probably not. Right? You <laughs> grab it, yeah. and, you know. <laughs> but the process of making it exactly. certainly right. could have some unique steps. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, but probably the process of use claim would be an invention that's a little bit complicated to use. True. Yeah. The more complicated it is, the, the, you have more uh, um, weight yeah. and uh, eventually get some detail that I really need and eventually mm -hmm. make it Because in a sense, I mean, if your invention is simple, that's good and that it's easy for you to make, sure. but it's more difficult to patent. And it's more easy for people to copy. If your invention is complex, it's easy to patent, hard for you to make, but it's hard for people to copy it. <laughs> you know, like, more complex inventions, I mean, and if they don't know that there's only two other companies that can make this. No one else can. So, oops, they got their, uh, they know the scope of their competition pretty easily. And it's, it's often very difficult to have a patented, uh, simpler version of something already there as a very complex. Mm -hmm. Because of what is already there, complex, is uh, quite broad, quite quite uh, big, uh, full of detail, uh, and you try to get some of them uh, that are already there, but uh, say, well, this is sufficient, this is enough, it's a simplification, it's, that's a challenge, right? Yeah, yeah you got to think about, yes. I mean, if someone's going to knock you off, what do they, I mean, I'm going to say it, let's see about it. What are they typically going to do? They're going to make a quick, dirty, cheap version of what you make, right? And try to sell it cheaper. So you got to kind of play devil's advocate and think about if they do that, this might have to cover that type of version. So writing a patent for a medicine cabinet is probably so common, right? The frame of it, sure. box. But you might think of like creating two versions, like a simple version and then your deluxe version. Because so. there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, people will put multiple versions in of an invention, like say 60, 70% of the hardware is the same, and then that other 30% changes. Each version. But the structure of it could be like kitchen cabinet, medicine cabinet, just the shape of it, right? Yeah. And make it really true. But like don't thing. say medicine. Don't need to right. Just don't say yeah, enclosure. Think Bronx. To store whatever you want to put in. Uh, right. Yeah. Unless the, the, the cabinet is specifically able to detect the sniffing the, the, the medications. <laughs> yes. So you need to think of what is the novelty of my, of my cabinet versus what is already commercialized and known, right? You need, yeah. to, uh, you need to think about the uniqueness of your medicine cabinet, right? Yeah. Uh, because you don't uh, want to invent a uh, generic medicine cabinet, right? Because it's already there. So, uh, what is making my invention really unique, special? What I'm adding is uh, when I open the door, there is uh, uh, some, uh, some music, for example. Uh, like, uh, you see something special, something, you know. And of course, the medicine cabinet with the, with the mirror already living. 
So what is special now of my of my magazine habit? Right? Yeah. Uh, what kind of feature? Maybe incorporate a, a radio or <laughs> 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 some some uh, uh, feature that uh, make it really stand standing out from the commercial point of view. Yeah, and you should also you know search it. Yeah. To see what's out there. Yes. Because you can you can do a lot online these days. Right, a lot of search and be sure that you don't invent uh, what already been invented, which is already on the market. Right, you try to avoid all this because uh, when you pay in your final fees for patent, one portion is you pay for the search that the examiner <laughs> is going to do. So. You can try to do it yourself as much as you can to avoid the surprises, yeah. right? The question that you ask yourself is the way the novelty of my invention, right? And that's the same question. Yeah, the examiner the will, will, will wonder, right? I think I have a novelty in a more ideas just sitting here. But <clears throat> so if I were to uh, apply, just, I just put in a basic patent idea with several versions, and then the meantime, go improve my product because I have a prototype already. So that would protect me. To it's nice, it. yeah. It's, it's good to do it in this order uh, design it, search it. And prototype it so you at least have an idea of mm -hmm. how to make it, and then probably do a provisional patent to just get patent pending yeah. in a simpler, lower cost way yeah. for a year, and then market it right. and see what happens. Right. Because a provisional, you know, it's a nice system, it's only in the US. And but it's a much slower filing fee, and yeah, and um, it it gives you patent patent protection. So they sold that for the yeah. final. Uh, but that doesn't yeah. protect me from somebody outside the country, right? You can't. It doesn't mature into a patent, and you can't sue them. But basically, it gives you a priority disclosure date with the government. Mm -hmm. So if someone copies it, you can say, um, my priority date, you're anti-dated, right. your product launch. Um, so not to either pay me a licensing fee, quit doing it. Is <laughs> reserving you an early, early date. Yeah. So you testify that, uh, you, can, you can testify that you invented your invention a year ago already. Right. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, although there is some uh, point that misses some, some traps in the provision because uh, how, how detailed it is, is to be your, your provision, right? <laughs> because then uh, you don't want a provision that very shallow that doesn't really when it comes to the to claim when you do the real uh, application, you, you're going to claim a, a provision that doesn't really contain uh, any detail of what you have. Now in the I mean, from our standpoint, we treat the provisional like it's the real thing. Yes. It should be complete. It should be, it should be perfect complete. It's just uh, it's got a low filing fee. The patent office, they make sure the parts are there, but they don't examine the research equipment. That's the difference, really. When you file a non provisional, they examine and search it. Right. But it should be as complete as possible. Right. right. But, you know, when you file the non provisional, it's an opportunity if you want to add a feature to the invention. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it depends on the, the, the degree of uh, completeness, right? Yeah. If you are a provisional. They, they really should have called it a provisional patent. They should have called it a 
disclose your priority document yeah. or something because it's never going to be a patent. <laughs> but the thing is, they when you file them at the patent office, they never go public. That provisional stays secret. So uh, you know, see, no one's going to see it. Competitors aren't going to see it. China won't see it. Yeah. And the thing is, you it's perfectly fine to do multiple provisionals sure. on the same invention. So yes. let's say in that year you, you uh, file a provisional and then six months later you say, I have three new features that I found out in my market. So we'll do another provisional and we'll cover those three features. Because you cannot uh, amend or add anything new to the, the one. Yeah, everything's added. Oh, like yeah, so. You file one, it's fixed. So if I have to stuff, one. I have to file again. Yeah, you find another one. It's just affordable. It's just okay. everything has to be done in that one year. Right. You know. So then when you file the non provisional, I'll reference provisional one. Provisional two, sure. provisional three, yeah. yeah, you can do that. So everything has to be done in a year. So you're talking design, search, prototype, and then you file a non-provisional. But it's not all over then, because uh, you file a non-provisional. If you have changes after that, we file continuations. Which is in a way, so it's, it's not, another pattern. That we know it's about. probably a pretty good chance that you're going to have changes to the invention after you file the first patent. So we want to cover that. It does cost some money, though, because you got to file another, another half. But the, the question you have to ask yourself is this new feature I'm adding, is how important is it? You know? Yeah. If it's important, you want to get yeah, it. Work to keep you yeah. to, uh, basically another application. Yep. So the extension, or was it extension? Is that you can like at the year, at the end of the year, you can what? Uh, file a non provision which is going to be the official application claiming. The, the you just link them. That's how you just link the applications together. Maybe the early day of the, of the provision. Oh, sure. Yes. The reason you do that is so the patent office can never use your own invention against you. Oh. Because they can't. Once it's public. Because <laughs> it's anything in the public domain can be used to um, for your patent. Even if it's yours. <laughs> also, that's a reason for the continuation that you, the mother application that you are referencing, you need to be still uh, under constitution, right? Yes, yeah, okay. Right. So, uh, on those continuations for new features, there's no limit. Other than the immediate prior has to be pending. It's dependent, right. Once you are you get the patent on the release, then you cannot basically you can still eventually find if the additional feature and additional improvement are significant to that point, then then you can. But ideally, you should find a continuation with some additional features that you came up with through, um, before, um, while the other application, the mother application, is still pending, not officially closed and moving, not patented. Right. So the, the one catch is that um, no matter how many continuations you file, the life of the Continuation is based on the first uh, patent, so you can't stretch your patent like that. Like that, yeah, you can't stretch it past the first year. Twenty. So let's say my non-provisional went in, and then 
was pending for three years, that filed a continuation. And so the continuation's life is 17 years because the original patent is 20, but the continuation's life starts on the original patent's timeline. So no matter how many continuations you file, the cutoff date is the same. 20 years. Otherwise, people would file them and keep <laughs> they they uh, illegally extend their monopoly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's say the medicine cabinet, I think. And I'm worried that other people could have the same pattern or document or whatever. Um, so I would just make the measurements different than the typical medicine cabinet, right? Right, you have to be novel. But measurements is, is not a strong, uh, strong difference. Compared to, you can say, well, my, my cabinet is only 30. Inches uh, instead of the prior art uh, that is. Um, but the features, I mean, the features will be different. Than yes. The oh, uh, yes. So the the length uh, somewhat shape uh, not so strong also, uh, and, and and also the. Uh, what what they're looking for uh, is what your change is. Yeah. Is a functional benefit. Yeah. No. That's so, the advance within the tech. Color, shape, exteriority in the in the in the uh, um, in the utility part of it is not uh, it's not a strong like the door differential. Like the door could be something not glass or mirror or wood. Exactly. The, the, the material the material of some component are not a strong. Uh, yeah. And unless it's important to its function, like a battery, materials are everything, right? It just it depends on the, the invention. Okay, so yeah. like if I'm cleaning this, I'm not going to specify materials because there's so many materials in the yeah. But if the materials are related to the function, like with the battery, then it's kind of a big deal. Right, the, the insulation of the yeah. right? So, so what, what if inside the medicine cabinet there was, uh, I created little circles or whatever, like a toothbrush, a regular toothbrush, and holds your toothpaste. So that's structured. That can be, so that's structured. It can be a, yeah. strong, uh, a strong difference if, around, uh, if nobody thought about uh, you know, putting hold there and uh, mm -hmm. that kind of facilitate the... Yeah, the and the research could tell you that. Yeah. And a search would give you a good idea of what people thought or a similar stuff. And there's a way to, and of course, the, the prior art and the search should not be in the United States. Right? Because uh, your search should not be limited to the United States. Right? Because uh, the prior art is uh, worldwide. So the examiner can. can uh, Bring in a pattern that was uh, done in Botswana. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, how do you search? Right? Is there a way to search all of the countries or do you have to name the countries? China? You can do both. I mean, it just, it's a matter of how much time <laughs> or you pay someone to do it. But, uh, you know, you, you do have to kind of like limit the scope, you know, so you're, you're catching most of what's out there. You never catch everything because it would be uneconomical to yeah. search for it. And, and also your, your search should not be limited just to pattern, but there is a scientific article in the... Uh, yeah, what we call verse NPL, non patent literature, so it can be... Right. Magazine articles, disclosure, teasers, uh, the university. Um, yeah. Many, many inventors uh, come from the university. 
but CPU that you need. That stuff is harder to search, though. So. Yes, it is. But, but the examples are organized but the, right, by their technology. Sure. But those articles and stuff, um, they're kind of harder to find. And usually, you have to like pay money to get into specialized databases to search. But that, that can be worthwhile, depends on what the technology Jesus yeah. University published and uh, so yeah to, just to not to focus just on patents. Oh like you know, if you can scope out the search precisely, like let's say your invention is a composition that contains a special chemical. So you say, I want to see all the patents that use this chemical. Or uh, scientific articles that mention this chemical. So you could do that. Yeah. Remember the patent application, even they didn't uh, produce a patent worldwide, can be brought as a kind of practical invention. Somebody initially had the idea to find a patent, even though he didn't succeed, uh, he or she didn't succeed to get a patent, yeah. is documented, and you cannot uh, use it. The, the, the so, 55% roughly of the patents given over. So 45% don't. But most all that 45% they publish as file. So they're still prior art. Even though they're never gonna they're never gonna be the patent. Right. That is a little bit of a benefit eventually or, or also for you. If you yeah. don't succeed with the patent, with your, uh, with your cabinet, you know that nobody can do a patent on your Right. They you, can you, you've, you. Uh, you became a blocker. So yeah, you can become a blocker. <laughs> if I, somebody if I have, a let's say there's a technology, right. and I'm like, I don't know if this is patentable, it's kind of iffy. Right. But you know, I got this competitor over here, I'm worried they're working on something like that. So I'm going to file a sacrificial. Mm -hmm. Patent, and well, I'm never gonna like push it to get issued, but it's blocking. gonna be blocking. Wow! It's not yeah. somebody else. Yeah. In other words, you're forcing something into the public domain. Right. Exactly. So, uh, it, patent, yes, it, 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 it prevents uh, your patent application, even though it didn't produce a patent. Nobody can can produce a patent on your. Uh, on your right. So I, I tell people that to make you feel better. Like, well, look, well, you couldn't get a patent on it. But the, but the good news is, is nobody, nobody else can, can either. Nobody <laughs> can patent it either. Right. So nobody's going to get an advantage over you. You're just going to be on an equal playing field. Like, it's public, right? It's public. Nobody gets and exclusivity. And everybody and is, is cleared out. And then, it never no. is cleared out. Your, no. your inventions then, get. You, the prior art will never stay forever. You are, you are gonna, oh, the prior art, yeah, it's yeah, there forever. It's forever. Right. It stays forever. You know, like, you could be rejected against a 100 year old guy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I got an infection on the uh, 1700 something part of this, uh, you know, uh, right. So, yeah. So, yeah, it is there forever, right. Yes. So the patent kind of has two lives. It's active life, and then it expires, but it's prior art. Blocking prior art. Right. right. And, and don't forget to, that once you have the patent, the expenses are not over because you need to the, spend money to maintain it for the 20 years. Yeah, the renewal fees. The renewal fee at the year of, of uh, four, uh, seven, and back, you need to pay money to maintain it. How much is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not easy, money. but it, it's stair steps. It starts mm -hmm. cheap. Oh, well, cheap it goes so mm -hmm. it's the cheapest. It, uh, it's at like 480. 800, 800, 
So they make the first one cheap, but on the assumption that as your patent ages, you should be making money on the invention. Right. And, you will and, and if you're not, then you're poor. those fees are optional. And if you don't make money, oh. you don't have to pay them, but if you don't, your patent expires. Yeah. Early. And many are not interested. To so it's, yeah. you know, you have this fixed patent system and you got all these different technologies. So patent life's 20 years. Well, on an electronics invention, at five, maybe obsolete anyway. All right. So you're never going to pay those other agencies on a mechanical tool. Will probably good for the whole twenty years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So the whole thing is like more people pay that first maintenance fee than pay the last one. Mm -hmm. And the other reason is is because they go. Also, the most expensive. Oh, the good news. Uh, I don't know if you will qualify eventually. There's the three, there's three tiers of fees. One for the large corporation, IBM, General Electric, like, can afford a bunch of money. Uh, one, one for this smaller organization that have a certain number of employees or dependent or so. And then they came up a few years ago with a micro entity for just the individual inventor that um, probably never fly for patent. It's the first patent that they buy. So they want to give an incentive to, to, to them and the, the, the final fee is after the small entity. The fee is so, so you probably qualify for one micro entity and not even uh, that the limit of four patent application for patents and so on and so on. So, but, uh, you know, and the certain amount of money on the base of your uh, income money, which is now is probably one hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year as uh, just the gross income the number of the in your way. Um it's yeah. hundred and fifty some thousand. Yeah, I mean, yes. Most right. people qualify for that. Yeah. It's yeah. uh it's the poor patent. Yes. Yeah. But the catch in it is but it's all your joint inventors coming there and your investors and everybody. So if one of the four inventors is their fifth patent, it blows it for everybody. <laughs> so if you're an individual inventor and you have no outside funding, then it is just you. The symbol. Okay. Yourself, I mean, it's that system is meant to help individuals. Just an individual, uh, yeah. Because when you get the maintenance fees, the differences are in the thousands of dollars. Yeah. So yeah. So the, the patent office is uh, your file fee is below their cost, so they're making up their money and the maintenance fee. Right. So you could say that I mean on a micro entity your your non-provisional file fee is four thirty. But their cost is probably five hundred or something like that. Because they're they're like doing two things for you. They're doing a search and so it, it's kind of it helps the inventor uh, yeah. with lower fees up front right. um, and then bigger fees later when hopefully the invention is making money. Right. And then they definitely will make money on the large corporations, right? Yeah. That's the theory. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so give a little bit of. Uh, Sent it to the yeah. videos to, to work. I guess I'll talk to the video. By the fee, I'm pleased that by the fee.